Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this week's edition of Kibitzing with Kagan, brief conversations with people I find fascinating. I am almost done with interviewing every member of the Moore Miller administration's cabinet. And this week, I'm delighted to welcome the acting secretary of the Maryland Higher Education Commission, or MHEC, Dr. Sanjay Rai. Dr. Rai, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Senator Kagan, for this opportunity. I'm really looking forward to a good conversation. Good. <clears throat> well, we have so much to talk about, but I want to start with your background. <clears throat> because you grew up in India and went to school there, got your bachelor's and your master's degree there, and then came to Canada and got another master's degree in math, uh, a lot of math background, and then got your PhD at the University of Arkansas. Talk about, so our Lieutenant Governor, Aruna Miller, talks about her arrival from India to the United States. Tell us about yours. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a journey of an immigrant. Uh, uh, lots of opportunities, lots of support. So thankful uh, for all the support that I have here in Canada and, and in India as well. Uh, undergraduate, uh, you know, studying in Indian system, uh, very different than transitioning into to, to, to Canadian system for master's. Yes. And again, transition to 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 U.S. Yes, you know, I had the opportunity to look at higher education in three different countries. Yes, and, and you know, so much to learn from 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 different ones. Absolutely. So, did you have? I wonder about your language skills when you arrived here. Did you speak English much, or was that something else you had to learn when you arrived? Well, we I spoke English. Uh, you know, India since because of being a British colony. Uh, English was spoken, but uh, only in certain parts of the society, not where I come from. Yes. So certainly language is something I had to work with. Okay. So then you started teaching and you started in the South, in Texas and Florida. When you moved to Rockville to, t to be at Montgomery College 20 years ago, that must have been another huge culture shift. Tell us about that. I think that was a wonderful opportunity to come to Montgomery College in Montgomery County. Such supportive environment, collaboration, especially with the elected officials, business industries, and outstanding faculty, Montgomery College faculty, completely dedicated. Uh, it was just a fun 20 years of, of journey. Um, and one of my first uh, you know, major tasks as dean when I came at Rockville campus uh, was the science center. Yes. So getting funding uh, for the center, getting faculty, students all together and designing a space which was futuristic and really adequate for 21st century uh, science. Uh, I just loved it. That's great. Well, you were a dean, a vice president, and the provost. Uh, I was going to ask what your proudest accomplishment was at Montgomery College, but I think you just told us. So good for you. Uh, so talk about the journey to to MHEC, to the Maryland Higher Education Commission. When did you first meet Wes Moore and how did the conversation start about you possibly joining his cabinet? So again, you know, this it was a, a couple of interview process, application interview process. And, and you know, I was recommended uh, by, by a few people as well. Uh, first interview with, with uh, um, you know, appointment folks, lieutenant governor, and some others. Uh, it happened sometimes in December of, of last year. Okay. And then, uh, you know, interview with governor uh, once sometimes in February, March. And, okay. and here I am. <laughs> so you were the last cabinet secretary nominated, and you are still acting secretary. So hopefully that'll move forward soon. Uh, tell us what it's like working with the other members of this extraordinary cabinet. I think it's an amazing cabinet. Everyone has, is a professional with serious background in, in the area that they are leading. That makes such a difference. And everyone wants to collaborate. There are no silos. I can pick up a phone and talk to my uh, colleague in labor, uh, Secretary Wu, and then we can come back with some ideas and, and implement it right away. Mm -hmm. And we speak the same language because we have been, we are coming from the same same background. 
Yes. So it's just amazing opportunity, amazing opportunity. So tell me what the department was like when you arrived. What was the vacancy rate? What was the biggest challenge that you had to address right away? So I think that uh, agency uh, over the last 10 years or so, they have seen a lot of uh, cuts in positions and, and other resources. And at the same time, the amount of work they have to do has almost doubled. Yeah. So morale issues, things like that, and, and several open positions. So, you know, I met one-on-one -on -one with each employee right. at Merrill Higher Education Commission. How many do you have? See, I have, uh, at that time, I had about 60. Okay. And about 14, 15 positions were open. Okay. So wow. me met with everyone. Uh, it was great to hear from them, their contributions, their ideas, mm -hmm. how to take the agency forward. Uh, then we, we filled pretty much all the position. Uh, maybe a couple of positions are open, but we filled every position and, and we are we're moving forward. So internally, uh, morale of, of the agency employees, but also building confidence in our stakeholders. Yes, good. So that's something, you know, we are still working on it. So, so let's talk fundamentally. What does the Maryland Higher Education Commission do? What services does it offer to our students, our families, and our colleges and universities? So in, in terms of students first, um, I would like to say this and take this opportunity again to, all, to say this to all Marylanders, $130 million of financial aid is available through the state system. Make sure you take full advantage of that. So that is one of our significant responsibility, making sure that the students have access to, to funds that they need. Uh, and removing financial barriers for our students uh, for post-secondary education. That's one, one responsibility. Again, we are a regulatory um, um, agency. Yeah. So all 16 community colleges, private independent institutions, Morgan State University, St. Mary's, University System of Maryland, we work closely with them in, on advancing uh, higher education in the state of Maryland. So... If there's a student out there who wants to think about higher education, whether it's a community college or four-year school, uh, talk about in-state versus out-of-state. Talk about what sort of help might be available. You talked about $113 million, uh, available in scholarship funds. Can you explain how they would start navigating the process? Let me, let, let me uh, say first, $130, $130 million. One, three, zero. Dollars. Maryland is unique. We have significant resources to help our students. Uh, in a state, out state, let me very be very clear. I don't want any student from Maryland to go out of state. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> My first message is you have high quality, outstanding institutions at a very affordable cost. Yes. You stay here. Amen. Absolutely. <laughs> Why look elsewhere? Yeah, and I will, I will add one more thing, Senator Kagan, um, uh, that explore your community colleges. Mm -hmm. They provide wonderful opportunities. You, you get, uh, uh, you know, outstanding education. And you stay in Maryland, your courses, your credits will transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, the time to degree will go down. And you will not have uh, any uh, or extraordinary loans and things like that. Right. So um, explore that pathway, community colleges to, to four-year universities within the state of Maryland. Absolutely. So you mentioned loans. So let's talk about President Biden's loan forgiveness proposal and program. Why don't you talk about that, what you think of it, how effectively it's working, and, uh, and how mm -hmm. many people is it helping in Maryland? So I, I think that uh, the idea is powerful, loan forgiveness. You know, people like me are... 100 support, 100% 100 uh, support of President Biden's uh, program. Why students are not able to, to, to pay back loans? We have to understand that, right? We have to understand that what are the forces that have put the students in that situation? So, you know, and who are these students who are not able to pay? Yes. So, so what this program is doing is, is I think, uh, is a wonderful effort. Um, I would say that more aggressive approach is needed than what we are doing right now mm -hmm. uh, is not enough. Uh, but the uh, state of Maryland had its own uh, opportunities 
uh, tax credits and other things uh, that uh, you know we are providing in addition to 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 what federal government is doing. Um, the federal government can only do so much, and COVID was a huge problem for families and students uh, thinking about higher education. And there's been a big drop off. Um, talk about that. And is MHEC doing anything to encourage people to uh, to enroll in higher education? Absolutely. And, and you know, I have appointed myself as chief recruitment officer <laughs> for the state of Maryland. Uh, you know, uh, Senator, just in, even in your area, in, in, in Gaithersburg, Rockville, mm -hmm. uh, entire Montgomery County, there are thousands of students, uh, high, recent high school graduates who are not enrolling in yes. any post-secondary. Yes. Uh, so we have to understand why, right? So they have full-time jobs and their families. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity for us to understand how to provide post-secondary education to those these students who are not able to access our present model of higher education. Yes. So we have to continue to think about how can college be student ready, right? So short-term training, you know, short-term training like, you know, certified nursing program that puts you, that gives you entry level skills in nursing or health sciences, yes. and also puts puts you on a path of undergraduate and associate uh, degree. So we have to start thinking about that is short term training, four weeks, three weeks, five weeks, uh, and then working with the students throughout uh, uh, their educational journey. Uh, we will have to do some of those things. And also, I think there is an opportunity to, to do more aggressive outreach, uh, especially in certain communities from where we are not getting students. A targeted approach is needed. And I think higher education can do more than what we have done so far. MHEC will partner with every institution yes. in making sure that we are reaching out to the communities that need post-secondary skills. Uh, and their... So I think the... I mean, the governor's vision of leave no Marylander behind, leave no one behind, MHEC almost feels like one of the most important for the long term. So the people who, the, the departments that are working on housing and community development and food and stuff right now. But what you're talking about is bringing our diverse and more challenged communities in for the long term, get them educated so they can great have great jobs and careers and provide for families and build up their communities and all of that, which is so exciting. Um, so don't have any idea how we start to do that. But um, but th there, there are families who start thinking about saving uh, for college when their baby is born and others who are on their own and suddenly they graduate from high school. Um, Tell me one example, <clears throat> excuse me, of something you're working on that's going to reach an underserved community. I think that uh, first, our financial aid information, we are reaching out very aggressively in every part of the state to various communities, targeted approach to making sure that, that you have all these uh, um, financial resources available. Uh, you know, federal financial aid is changing uh, and it has caused a little bit of uh, an issue, uh, implementation issue. They are mostly, they come through the technology yes. uh, side. Uh, while those are problematic, uh, I think uh, more students will be from Maryland will be available, will be eligible for federal financial aid. That's the good news. And my thought is that every resident, every student of Maryland who is eligible for federal financial aid we want to make sure that that student has an opportunity at one of our institutions to start um, uh, his or her post-secondary experience. We want to give them automatic admission. I'm going to reach out to every community college and say, these are 100 students in, in, in Rockville. Send them admission letters today. Wow. So talk about the delays just a little bit more because it's gotten a lot in the news, what's called the FAFSA form, and you have to complete it before you can apply, uh, before you can get financial aid, before you can apply for a senatorial scholarship with me and others. How how big a challenge? And there's nothing we can do about it to fix it, right? 
Well, I think that uh, you are right. I mean, this is federal financial aid application that determines your eligibility for yes. the aid and how much aid you are eligible for, right? And your office has done a wonderful job in providing scholarships to residents in Gaithersburg and Rockville. I, I thank you for that and, and, and your leadership. I know you're very active. I hear from you. Yes, <laughs> you're very, very supportive of your <laughs> students. So while we can't change much about the issues that are there, uh, but we can be proactive and we are proactive. We are giving information through town halls, through school counselors, that this is what the situation is. And we are adjusting our process. Although, you know, it's, it's, it's a moving target, yes. right? So, and we have created uh, what is called one app. So Maryland has various different applications. Mm -hmm. So until, you know, a few months ago, the students have to go to each one of them, yes. right? So we have made it very easy. So one application for all scholarships. And at the same time, that application, in my opinion, is, is very uh, um, easy to fill and the experience will be more enjoyable uh, than what it was before. I am not aware of that and look forward to learning more about it and helping push it out there because that's huge. That's great. Um, I don't want to harp on bad news, but let's talk about the mess in the 529 program. Can you explain what that was, what the, briefly, what the challenge was and, uh, and where things are right now? Because it seems like it's on the, on the upswing. Uh, so I've, 529 is not with, with uh, MHEC anymore, so... So it's in the treasurer's office, but if you could describe yeah, what that yeah. is, because a lot of families take advantage of that. Yeah. So that's a that's a savings program for college tuition to help yeah. families and uh, to afford college. So let's go to uh, to better things. Um, the your website talks about the culture of risk taking. Why don't you talk about what that is and what you what kind of risk you hoping uh, people take? You know, my life is all about taking risk. We talked about earlier leaving uh, India, coming here. Yes. And when I came here, I certainly started with the university system. I was tenured full professor, department head. And I came to, to a community college, right? And every time I took a risk, I have benefited from it. Yes. So, uh, you know, that is my philosophy. I want the students to take risk, challenge themselves right? Don't say, oh, in grade six, I didn't I like algebra or I didn't like uh, computer programming. So I'm not, I'm going to leave this STEM area and yes. look at something else. Now, I'm not saying every student should, should pursue STEM degrees, but challenge yourself. You are in a digital economy. Even, you know, whatever your major is, make sure you have these skills that employers are looking for in today's economy. Absolutely. That's great. Um, so I wonder, since we're recording this while the legislature is in session, we pass laws every year that affect higher education, that affect job prospects and career paths. How That must be a challenge for you to try to navigate and update and, and make sure that the word is getting out about increased opportunities for students. Yeah, so I think that is a challenge, uh, but I think... Uh, uh, the laws, I tell you, some of the laws that have been passed before, they have brought pretty serious uh, uh, impact on students and, and institutions. Uh, what comes to, to mind is CCR, CCA. Uh, don't ask me to, 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 to <laughs> translate uh, it. Okay. Translate it, but college and career uh, readiness. Readiness, uh, of course. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, uh, you know, uh, reducing degrees to 60 degrees, 60 credits and, you know, developmental education reforms, all those things have been very helpful. Yes. Uh, I will give you today, I mean, the, you, you are involved with this Transfer with Success Act. Mm -hmm. So we are implementing that while it's, uh, ex it's a very... So because of that bill, Senate Bill 740 uh, or something like that, if my memory serves me right... Uh, each degree has been reduced to 60 credits. So that is good. On an average, you know, they were getting to 65 to 72, 73 credits. Yes. Reduces the time and cost. Sure. Uh, then developmental education reforms. The students uh, who finish developmental education, they should immediately enroll in the 
a college level course in mathematics okay. or English. Because of all that, student success has gone up in the state of Maryland. Uh, yeah. More recently, I want to give you the example of Transfer with Success Act. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very important and, and a huge opportunity for us to help a student transition from community college to four-year uh, schools. Yes. So it's, it's, it's a huge task for my agency, but it's an important work that we are taking it very seriously, especially because of my background, uh, seeing yes. the work from community colleges yes. and seeing uh, issues with the transfer. We want all credits to transfer to our Maryland institutions. We want to make sure that those credits are not only transferred, they are applied to their, their, their major. Yes. That an academic sense. program and loss of credit that happens from community college to, to four year, we want to reduce it to zero. Yes. Well, that's so, a, that's a beautiful goal. Uh, so there is a bill that I sponsored last year that is law that allows people who are not yet citizens to get their licensure in healthcare occupations. And so young students who decide that they want to be a doctor, a nurse, a, veterans, a veterinarian's assistant, or any of those, uh, um, a nurse practitioner, they can do that even, un, even before they become American citizens. I wonder how students are hearing about opportunities like that. Yeah, I think that, first of all, thank you for, for sponsoring that bill and thinking about it. Uh, I can tell you that... Um, uh, Montgomery College, in my role there as chief academic officers, we started early colleges. These early colleges are very different than what you see in, in other, other places. They were targeted in healthcare, IT, cybersecurity, areas where our economy has, has lots of opportunities. So in that one, uh, you know, our students, uh, we started a nursing early college. Yep. The first issue was that Students need to do get clinical experience when they are 18 year old or 19 year old, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to do this. And you know, our population here, our students uh, who are not citizen yet, and, yeah. and uh, you know, this bill is very, very helpful. Uh, we will make sure that uh, institutions, our counselors, and, and people who work directly with students are aware of this yeah. opportunity. Uh, anything we can do jointly, I'll, I'll welcome that, that opportunity as well. That would be great. Maryland ranks 50th, the longest waiting times in our emergency rooms. And that's because of our crisis level shortage in healthcare occupations. So that's that's why this is so critically important. I just have a couple more questions for you, Dr. Rai. Um, what do you think is the future of higher education? Paint us a picture. So I think that future of higher education is extremely bright mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 in these ways. Higher education will become more accessible, it will become more affordable, and it will be more meaningful. It will be more aligned to, to with the economy, with the with the jobs and and opportunities, and uh, people who who are what I call non traditional students. That is about two third of our our population mm -hmm. who are not able to access higher education right now they will have opportunity to gain post-secondary skills and be part of this wonderful economy that we have in our state of Maryland. That's great. That's great. Uh, and tell me what the biggest thing on your to-do list is. What is your biggest project, your biggest priority that you're working on right now? I'm glad you asked. I mean, there are a lot of logistical things. I will not get into that. Yes. Uh, we are working on uh, next stage of completion goals for the state of Maryland. Mm. In 2013, Maryland was one of the first state to come up with completion goals uh, during Governor O'Malley's time. Yes. Uh, that goal was that by 2025, 55% of the Marylanders will have an associate degree or higher. Huh. When I came in this role, I said, okay, let's see where we are. Yes, and? So, so a couple of things. We are not going to get to 55%, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, the, the achievement gap is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we'll be coming up with uh, working with everyone, uh, all institutions, business industries, communities. What should be our next goals? Mm -hmm. Should we measure only associate degrees 
or a welding certificate or biomanufacturing certificate or mm -hmm. cyber security certificate. Or healthcare are, licensure. Healthcare, they are credentials of economic value. Mm -hmm. Defining what credentials of economic value are Yes. And then how can the students get to them in a debt-free uh, environment? Yeah. So we'll be coming up with new goals, but uh, not only in terms of degree completion, but uh, my personal interest is uh, focus on research and innovation. How can higher education create world-class economy in the Love state it. of Maryland? So how can we have uh, more company business-sponsored research at our research institutions? How many patents are coming out of our institutions and what is the market value of each patent? Yes. So creating market-driven research, innovation, licenses, those startups, how many startups are coming out of our institutions of higher education? Yes. I believe, you know, the future is bright. Yes. And uh, emerging economy is in our favor. Well, but higher education can play a larger role than what it has so far. Okay. Well, well said. Uh, and it must be fabulous to have uh, a big ally with you in terms of our governor. And for those who have never heard him talk about this, Governor Westmore talks about how the one school ring that he wears is not from fancy schools. It's from his community college. Absolutely. And that's what helped launch him on his way. And now he's the governor of Maryland and who knows what the future is going to bring. But uh, I, it must be wonderful to have him in your corner. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, he wears that ring very proudly and he shows it everywhere. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, I am probably the first secretary of higher education who has some experience from a community college. I love so, that. So I think, you know, he's delivering on his promises yeah. as well. So. Yes. Well, not just a community college. Let's be clear. Let's <laughs> brag about Montgomery College, one of the top, top, top in the nation. Uh, so that's fantastic. So Dr. Sanjay Ray, Rai, sorry, uh, Acting Secretary of the Maryland Higher Education Commission. It is time for Fast Five. Five quick questions, five quick answers. Question number one. What was your dream job when you were a child? What did you think you wanted to be? Teacher. Okay, look at that. You <laughs> did it. Uh, question number two. If you were given $1,000 that you had to spend on yourself only, what would you do? Oh, tough question. $1,000 is a lot. I don't really spend that much money. Right. Uh, you know, I will... Uh, uh, probably, uh, I have a scholarship fund at Montgomery College, uh, Rye Family Scholarship. That will be one place. I have given my uh, royalties, book royalties, and others to the same, and it will probably go there. I love that. That's amazing. Thank you. Question number three, what's a hobby that helps you relax and get your mind off of all your work projects? Um, reading news. Okay. Reading news, not only local or national, uh, international news. I mean, I'm, I follow everything. Uh, take your mind off. And also you learn about the world. And, and when I read something, I just don't read it. I look at the geography. I'll go to the globe. I'll learn everything where this place is. So I enjoy doing that. That's impressive. All right. Question number four. What's the best advice a friend or mentor has ever given you? Listen, listen, patience. I think listening skills are most important and one can benefit so much uh, from it. Uh, That's great. I'm listening. I'm waiting in case you had something more you wanted to say. <laughs> Question number five, Dr. Sanjay Rai, what is your hidden secret superpower? What is a skill or talent you have, something you're really good at that most folks can't do? I don't think I have any hidden superpower or anything. Um, I just work very hard. Um, and then people think, oh, you're very smart, right? <laughs> uh, I just work hard. And one thing I'll say that that is there because of uh, my upbringing, I'm very humble. Mm. So, uh, you know, I'm still the same person who came as a as an international student from from India, is still looking for opportunity, is mm. still being very, very thankful to 
to to this uh, this nation um, and the state of Maryland. I am first generation high school graduate in my family, wow. and we are having this conversation as Secretary of Higher Education. Yeah. It can only happen in this the great country and this great state of Maryland. Amazing. Well. Acting Secretary of MHEC, Maryland Higher Education Commission, Dr. Sanjay Rai, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your service to the young people of Maryland, uh, because you are clearly helping to educate them and prepare them for their, their careers, their jobs, and their lives. So we appreciate thank you. you.